Hello and welcome back to SecureGate. Today, we're going to focus on web filtering within a FortiGate firewall. I'm going to try and keep this video short and straight to the point, so let's start by talking about the purpose of web filtering. And there's three common reasons why you would want to do web filtering. First one is to block inappropriate or malicious content. Second reason being to protect bandwidth usage. And then the third common reason is just enhancing productivity, you know, blocking websites or categories of websites that people probably shouldn't be browsing during work or business hours. Okay, there's also three main methods to perform web filtering within a, a profile. The first one being specific URLs and domains. You can also include wildcards. The second method of web filtering is category-based web filtering using FortiGuard servers and categories. And with those you can block things like social media, gambling, pornography. And then finally we have content filtering. So those are the three most common methods. Now before we get into the actual creation of the web filter profile, we also need to talk a little bit about SSL inspection. On a FortiGate there are two methods of SSL inspection, certificate-based inspection and deep packet inspection. So let's navigate to this here real quick. Um, so we can see certificate inspection, deep packet inspection come as just default options. Let's talk a little bit about the benefits of each one. So the benefits of certificate-based inspection are really that it requires less processing power being used from the firewall and it doesn't require any client configuration. You don't have to go and install certificates on every machine that you want to manage. Now some of the cons of certificate inspection are you just have less visibility into the network traffic, especially encrypted traffic. Um, with certificate inspection, Fortinet is really just analyzing the headers of a certificate and making the best judgment call based off of that. With certificate-based inspection, you also may not be able to detect malicious content, especially if it's within an encrypted payload. Some benefits of deep packet inspection here, uh, really you get complete visibility into encrypted network traffic if, if it's done correctly. You'll be able to pick up on malware, intrusions, and other threats. And then you also get much more granular control over policy enforcement and content filtering just because of that increased visibility. Now some of the negatives of deep packet inspection is that it does require more processing power from the firewall. It does require certificate installation on all of your client devices that you want to manage and have that visibility into. And it also can be known to cause issues with some applications, uh, some websites. So. Uh, you do have to put more thought into deep inspection if you're going to be implementing it. And then there's also general privacy concerns around you or your organization having that much visibility into the network traffic. Now it's not an all or nothing situation. You know, you could use deep pack inspection for your general users and then you can use certificate inspection for the parts of the network that Know, may have more sensitive needs or a specific application that you know doesn't play well with deep inspection. You can have a custom firewall policy rule for that network traffic to use certificate inspection instead. Now I typically use certificate inspection for all of my clients unless they have a specific want or a need for deep packet inspection and they're willing to make that investment for the time and the money for labor to do it properly. So let's get into web filter configuration. Uh, we can see here there's three by default. We're gonna just go ahead and create a new one. I'm just gonna call it test and we'll leave it as flow. Um, let's block a few categories. So we can see by default, we already have some being blocked and that's fine. Uh, we have warnings set for a bunch, that's okay. I'm gonna look for job search, let's block that, just for the purpose of this demonstration. So I can pick a website that's 
easy to find. And I can show you the block in action later on. And then let's maybe find business, which I probably passed already. Maybe not. There we go, business. So we're going to block that. And, you know, if you're doing this in a production environment, you probably also want to block, you know, all the, the known malicious stuff, of course, which is up here. It should already be blocked by default. And I, depends on the environment, but I do like to block unrated websites. Let's see if there's anything else real quick. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing, you know, I like to block that one as well. And then depending on your environment, you, you may want to block some of these other adult and mature content. Right now we can see it's set to warning, which means the client or the user will, in theory, receive a browser warning. Um, now they may just get a generic certificate error if you're only using certificate inspection. But I think that's good for filters here. Um, let's talk a little bit about the order of operations within a web filter profile. Static URL filtering does come first. So down here we can see static URL filter. If you're using this and if you have websites or domains listed in here, that does take priority. So if you have something set to block specifically here, but the category that it belongs in is allowed, that website will be blocked because the static URL filter takes priority. Okay, second in that priority list is category-based filtering. So all of these categories come second. And then finally, you have content-based filtering, which is down here. So if you wanted to match specific pattern types and so on, I don't use this one all that often. I, I usually stick between the category-based filtering and the static URL filtering. I think that's good for our test here. I'm going to go ahead and hit OK to save it. Let's talk a little bit about licensing before we jump into the demonstration. With a 48 licensing, it does require a valid license in order for FortiGuard communication to successfully occur. Every time somebody browses the website, it's doing a lookup in real time to see what category that website falls under, and then it will take action based off of what you set here. Now, if you're only using static URL filter, technically you don't need a license. Now, for what license to use, I like to recommend a UTP or Unified Threat Protection Bundle as a minimum. That will get you your web filtering. It will also get you support on your firewall firmware um, and then updates from FortiGuard for application control, web filtering, antivirus, IPS, and all the other fun stuff that you'll want to be using. Okay, so I'm going to hit OK here. Let's go create or adjust our firewall policy. I've already narrowed down my filter here to pick the one that my test machine is going to be hitting. So I'm going to edit my security profiles and update it to that new web filter we just created. And a little bit of change management on this firewall. So change web filter. Okay, perfect. Now, I also want to just quickly point out that you can do user or user group based web filtering. Uh, we won't get into that too much during this video, but if that's something you're interested in, please feel free to leave a comment and uh, maybe we can create a video dedicated for that. It's a little bit more in-depth, but it does require a Fortinet single sign-on or FSSO and you have the ability to integrate it with your Active Directory. You can install an agent on a domain controller. Agent will monitor and collect user logins and then send that data back to the 48, allowing you to use 
uh, like a user or a user group in your source here. So that's great if like you have a marketing team that needs access to social media, but outside of that, you want to block social media for the rest of your organization. Uh, that's really where FSSO comes into play. But let's jump into the demonstration. Now that we have our web filter created and assigned, I have a uh, test machine pulled up here. And if you remember correctly, we blocked social media. So for example, if I go to facebook.com, uh, we are able to load facebook.com. So let's actually go back to our firewall. Uh, I'm going to edit this profile. Let's look for social media or social networking right here. So it's actually still set to allow. Let's set it to block. Click OK. So that saves the profile. Let's go back over here. Open up a new incognito window and try that one more. So we can see we get a more of a browser warning at this point. So Fortinet wasn't installed properly on your network. This is because we're using certificate-based inspection. It's just throwing a generic error message. Uh, so really what this means is the, for, the FortiGate is blocking the Facebook.com communication attempt. One final piece that I want to leave you with is the FortiGuard web filter lookup. So the website is fortiguard.com slash web filter. Uh, this is great for checking what category a website falls under. It's always good to double check websites that you might need to use for your business. Um, you might think LinkedIn is also social networking. Um, so maybe you want to block LinkedIn and to do so you're trying to accomplish that by blocking social networking category. Well, LinkedIn is actually, if I remember correctly, it's categorized as business. So by blocking just social networking, uh, you would actually still be allowing LinkedIn.com. Uh, we didn't get into it in this video, but web filter override would be one way of solving this. You can also use that static URL filter to manually block it if you so wish to do so. All right, so we will wrap it up there. Thank you very much for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe.